Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And one of the ongoing discussions concerning the State of Israel today and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict concerns Israeli settlements, settlements on the West Bank. Are they legal? Are they moral? Are they wise? Are they a serious obstacle preventing a peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians and implementation of a two-state solution? Well, on this edition of L'Chaim, we have a chance to explore some of the answers to these questions that are raised by Israeli settlements, as I'm very pleased to be joined by Eugene Kantorovich, a professor of law at Northwestern University, and Eugene is also a fellow with the Lawfare Project. Professor Kantorovich also is a leading expert on maritime piracy, universal jurisdiction, and international criminal law. Eugene, it's a pleasure to have you with us on L'Chaim. Thank you so much. Mark, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, uh, but we, just a little bit about yourself. Sure. You're from Chicago. I live in Chicago, yeah. I teach at Northwestern. But you actually are an immigrant. You came from where? I came from Kiev in the Soviet Union. When you were Born, how old? I was three years old. Born in the USSR. That's amazing. Uh, uh, what circumstances did your parents bring you to America? Uh, the jackson vanek Amendment. Exactly. So it was the late 70s. And uh, as part of detente, the Soviet Union got various economic concessions from America. In exchange, America got Russian Jews and ballet. <laughs> ballet. Where did you grow up when you first came to America? We lived in Brooklyn and the Washington Heights at first. And where did you go to high school? Went to high school in New Jersey in West Windsor, Plainsboro High School, right outside of Princeton. Really? Okay. And then I know that you then went to Chicago University. I went there for undergraduate and law school, which makes me a masochist. <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Uh, the unofficial motto of the University of Chicago at that time was, who said hell doesn't freeze over? <laughs> Wait, okay. That is the really common understanding of it, but it's also a great school. Yes. So you got a great, great education. education. Okay. And you are now at Northwestern. That's correct. And you're a professor of law? Yes, I teach the In which school. areas do you specialize? So I, I specialize in constitutional and international law and teach courses and write in both. Okay. And how about Jewishly? Where do you place yourself? Uh, I place myself in a synagogue three times a day. Do you uh, really? Yes. Um, so uh, I go to a, a synagogue. I think you'd call it an orthodox synagogue, though I, uh, I'm not a big fan of such labels. And you have a wife named Rachel? Yes, and four uh, wonderful children. That's wonderful. What ages? They are all six and uh, six and under. The oldest is six. And so, are you having a good life? Do you enjoy what you do these days? Oh, I have a fantastic life, thank God. <laughs> but you told me you have plans. Yes, indeed, we are, God willing, moving to Israel uh, this summer. Mazal which, uh, it's been it's been a long exile, and so <laughs> looking forward to it. Eugene, what prompted that decision? So, for two thousand years, we've been dreaming about being able to go back to Israel. As, as a people, we've been dreaming. And finally, that opportunity is available to us. The, the question is, what's, what's stopping us? Uh, 2,000 years of, of desire has prompted it. Also, wonderful sun, great cafes, caring people, beautiful country. But other, other than that, you know, it's, uh, for 2,000 years, you know, we've dreamt of going to Israel. And now there's no obstacle. There's no real obstacle. The door, the door is open. Why are we, why are we not going? That's, 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 that's the real question. Does this also in some way suggest to our audience what you feel is appropriate or not about a two-state solution? I don't think it has anything to do with a, a, a two-state solution. I think the settlements in Israel, the Israeli settlements, are fully consistent with a two-state solution. And indeed, I think one of the biggest unreported stories of this year is that a two-state solution has already been established. That is to say, this fall, a boss went to the United Nations and he said, recognize us as a state. He didn't say make us a state. He said, we already have a state. And you can tick off the factors, as he did. He said, we, have, we are recognized 
by 130 some countries. Almost as many countries recognize Palestine as recognize Israel. They have embassies, they have diplomats, they conduct foreign relations, they travel around to other countries. We have our own central bank, we have our own media, we have our own security forces, our citizenship laws. We enforce our own criminal laws, quite brutally often. Uh, so they have all of the features of a state. And so, so recognize us. And the United Nations General Assembly said, OK, we agree. You are a state. And I think the consequence of that is you don't need to talk anymore about the two-state solution. It's no longer a question of is there going to be a Palestinian state. All that is left is simply a border dispute between a de facto Palestinian state recognized already by the United Nations. It's not me saying they have a state. It's the United Nations saying they have a state. It's Mahmoud Abbas saying they have a state. And you can't maintain that you have a state that's an independent functioning state. As you, have to, as you have to, to be recognized by the United Nations, and that you're under Israeli rule at the same time. So this is the inconsistency. And when he finally, when he finally acknowledges statehood, what do you have left? You have a border dispute. There are areas in which Pal the, the, the writ of the Palestinian uh, state does not run, in particular Area C, of the, as it's known under the Oslo Accords, in other words, the area where all the settlers are. And there's the area where 95% of the Palestinians live, which is under exclusive Palestinian jurisdiction. And you have a border dispute, and that is a, a much less sensational mm -hmm. uh, question than Palestinian statehood or occupation. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying about what is real on mm -hmm. the ground today. There are sometimes a sovereign state is, in fact, occupied by a foreign army. And what the Palestinians would argue is that even if they have a Palestinian state, there are Israeli military forces all over the West Bank which have in some way a military control of what happens. Yes, there are areas in which for all intents and purposes the Palestinians are living a life of their own under their own jurisdiction and their own police authority. At the same time, the Israelis obviously have and want to have a military presence on all parts of the West Bank. And that is also an issue which has to be resolved. So there are indeed areas where uh, the Palestinian Authority has jurisdiction where there's no Israeli military presence, in particular the Gaza Strip and Area A of the West Bank is under exclusive Palestinian control. The claim of the Palestinian Authority is always that Gaza and the West Bank, even though they're awkwardly separated by Israel, are actually a single entity, and the United Nations clearly treated them as a single entity. Now, what, what the borders are is unclear. So there are areas that are under exclusive pa uh, Palestinian jurisdictions where the majority of Palestinians reside. The Israeli army does sometimes make incursions into these areas. You're talking about Gaza now. I'm talking about Gaza and Area A of the West Bank. Mm -hmm. and, but that doesn't make it less of a state. Just, for example, Gaza, uh, Palestinians sometimes make incursions into Israel. There are terrorist incursions. There's uh, thousands of rockets fired into Israel. That doesn't make Israel less of a state because the Palestinians conduct military and terrorist operations in it. So it's true that this, this is not a state that gets on well with Israel. But you wouldn't say Pakistan's not a state because America conducts military operations there. Or Yemen is not a state because America... America doesn't control Pakistan. Ah, so Israel does not control those parts of uh, the Palestinian Authority that are under exclusive Palestinian jurisdiction. Obviously, they have power over them because they're a stronger neighbor uh, in the sense that, but, th but, but that does not undermine someone's existence as a state. So indeed, Palestinians for a long time uh, have, have been uh, promoting, I think, a mutually inconsistent line of arguments. Uh, on one hand, please negotiate with us now because we have Mahmoud Abbas. He is our democrat democratically elected leader. On the other hand, we are not, we're denied the right to vote and we have no political outlet because we're under Israeli occupation. So how did Mahmoud Abbas become the democratically elected leader? You know, uh, a very emotional argument that people make is you know, if Israel is occupying the West Bank, it has to give the Palestinians the right to vote. Well, they have the right to vote. The question is why should they have the right to vote in Israel? Palestinians vote in elections for the Palestinian government. So I think they were suggesting maybe um, from Chicago, I should be sympathetic to this, that they vote twice. They vote for their government and the Israeli government. Uh, no one suggests that uh, Israelis living in the West Bank get to vote in Israel and for the Palestinian Authority. So the Palestinians, their polit uh, political rights are fully exercised uh, in elections for the West Bank. Now, it's true Mahmoud Abbas may be in the 90-something month of his 48th term, but that's their own internal, mm -hmm. uh, internal problem. Mm -hmm. So they have a government. They have some kind of political process in which they participate. Uh, now, it's true, Area C is not at all under Palestinian control. This is where 100% of the settlements are. 
but almost very few Palestinians live there, and 100% of the settlers live there. As far as Abbas is concerned, Section C is also in the Palestinian state. Yes, Abbas, Abbas wants a Palestinian state uh, that includes Area C, which is where there are about 50,000 Palestinians living and five to 600,000 uh, Israelis living. And he wants a Palestinian state. He really wants two things. He wants to control the territory and have it depopulated of Jews for him as a precondition. Mm -hmm. As far as you know, the, la the, the latest and most current you've heard is Abbas does not want any Jew living on what will be the Palestinian state from his perspective? Uh, well, I believe the Palestinian position is once you've removed all the Jews who are here, then you know, they can apply to immigrate here. But the obvious, pre the obvious precondition of, the, uh, uh, of Palestinians in all the negotiations is that Palestinian sovereignty is incompatible with there being Jews there previously. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting because I've conducted a study of settlements by other countries. So when we talk about discussions of settlements in international law, uh, and I'm not conceding that uh, Israeli uh, civilian communities uh, are violating any international law, but when you're talking about the things that might generally be called settlements, it's almost always discussed in the context of Israel. And it turns out that Israel is far from the only uh, nation that is engaged in conduct that could trigger the relevant international rules. And, for example, Turkey in northern Cyprus. So northern Cyprus. Uh, when Turkey invaded Cyprus in 1974, uh, it conquered the northern part uh, and has the majority of the population there is now Turkish settlers. So the question I wanted to look at is, where does one get this idea? So the Palestinians have this unusual... And what's Cyprus's attitude towards this Turkish population in Cyprus? They want the Turks to leave. I mean, the Turkish army. What, what, so this is exactly what I want to see. What, do, what does the international community say mm -hmm. about settlers Very elsewhere? Very good. Because in, in Israel, they say, oh, it's obvious the settlers have to leave, even in the third generation, even people who could not plausibly be called settlers themselves, that it's some kind of genetic condition, it's passed down, and they have to go. So is this generally how, how settlers are treated? So, for example, I looked at the UN-sponsored uh, peace provisions, uh, peace proposals for Morocco and Western Sahara, where again Morocco has imported so many settlers that the majority of the population there is settlers. And that's what really the international rules against settlement was, were designed to prevent, to uh, a kind of um, demographic undermining, changing the basic demographic facts. Uh, so, uh, for example, in Morocco and Western Sahara, Turkey and Cyprus, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, Indonesia and East Timor, in all of these cases, uh, the question of what to do about civilians who moved from, the occupy, from an occupying country to an occupied country, arose. And in none of these cases was the removal of a single settler regarded a precondition of uh, a peace deal. And it's not that it wasn't asked for. So for example, in the case of Vietnam, people don't know about these cases, but uh, when Vietnam occupied uh, Cambodia in the 1980s, uh, hundreds of thousands, no one knows how many, two to 500,000 Vietnamese moved from Vietnam to Cambodia. And did Cambodia object? They objected very strongly. Uh, now, when they were under occupation, they didn't have much room to object. But at the peace, at the uh, international peace uh, pr proceedings to resolve the uh, dispute, the Cambodians said the Vietnamese have to go. So us Khmer don't like to have. They're going to remind us of the occupation. It's not just the army that has to go. It's the civilians mm -hmm. who have to go. Uh, we're, it's going to cause conflict. We resent them and so forth. The international community rejected that demand as fundamentally illegitimate. The civilians, why do they have to go? Why can't you live with an ethnic minority? And the international Under the sovereignty yeah. of Cambodia. Yes. But the international community also made another point about these settlers. They said, well, they're not really settlers. Because here's the history. The history was in the 1970s, uh, during the massive violence that was going on in, in Cambodia, with the Khmer Rouge uh, and other violence, uh, many uh, ethnic enemies, the Vietnamese, were forced to flee to Vietnam, hundreds of thousands. When Vietnam occupied Cambodia, Hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese came back in the other direction, some of whom were the ones who were previously there and others who were not. The reaction of the international community uh, and many leading international uh, legal experts was, well, you can't really say that they're settlers because they're just coming back to places where they had been kicked out of 10 or 20 years ago. They're not strangers here. Now, what could be a more accurate description of Israel coming back into the uh, Gush Etzion and Jerusalem and Hebron where there had been a Jewish presence until the Jordanians kicked them out in 1948 and 1949. So the it's the exact same mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. uh, and no one suggested that these people would be, uh, be kicked out. 
That's Cambodia, Vietnam. Yes. What, what about the Turkish Cyprus example? Very similar, very similar. Uh, under the peace proposals uh, proposed by the United Nations, the vast majority of the settlers would be not only allowed to stay, but participate in the new elections, given, uh, given citizenship. Again, and, and they would be under the sovereignty of Cyprus. That's correct. Mm -hmm. now, you could, now, people say, oh, well, why don't settlers stay, you know, so maybe it would be okay if settlers stay under Palestinian sovereignty. But that's a, that's a joke issue, because the Palestinians have made it clear they don't want this. They, want, they, they do not want a country with Jews whose minority rights they're now going to have to respect. That's their basic precondition. And the Cyprus want to incorporate the Turkish settlers? Well, they want the territory back. And, the, the, and they will say, okay, we'll ha let the Turkish settlers stay Again, as the, long as they're part of Tur uh, Cyprus. They don't have a peace treaty yet, but the peace treaty that was proposed by the international community, the parties haven't accepted it yet, prov uh, pr provided that, the, that they would stay, S similar with Indonesia and East Timor. Now, Morocco and Western Sahara, the Baker Plan, proposed by former Secretary of State James Baker, uh, allowed the, Moroccans to, uh, the Moroccan settlers to stay and participate in the plebiscite on the t uh, future of the new territory, the numerical majority. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I don't want to compare uh, Israel to these other cases of settlement. You don't, because it sounds to me like you do. You might, it sounds to me like what you're saying is, if one makes an analogy, the international community should, should say to the state of Israel and to the Jewish people, the settlers who have come into the West Bank, number one, have returned where they were kicked out by the yes. Jordanians in 1947-48, and they have a right to stay there under Palestinian sovereignty. Yeah, well, that's 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 the that's that's the part I uh, I uh, the part of the comparison that uh, may not be quite accurate. Because, Why? Because t when Turkey conquered Cyprus, invaded Cyprus, it was invading territory which was clearly not its own. Uh, there was no question that Cyprus was under the sovereignty of the pre-existing country called Cyprus. When Israel came into the West Bank in 1967, it was not coming into some pre-existing country. It was rather simply kicking the Jordanians out of that part of mandatory Palestine, which they illegally occupied in an attempt to prevent the creation of the Jewish state. So that's a difference. But I'll say well, another thing, interesting thing, when you look at how settlements are treated elsewhere in the world. So Israel is said to be violating a rather arcane provision of international law, Article 49.6 of the Geneva Convention. We'll talk about that in a second. But in none of these other cases of manifest settlement, of, mani of manifest violations of 49.6, is that provision ever mentioned, suggesting it's actually probably very hard to violate it. So it seems that Israel is the only country that under international law can violate this provision. And what is the provision? So the provision is a provision of the Geneva Convention, uh, a treaty which deals with the treatment of civilians in wartime. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. The treaty does not use the word settlement. The treaty does not use the word settlement at all. Settlement is simply the translation of the Hebrew word yeshuv, which refers to small startup communities on either side of the green line. Rather, the treaty says, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer part of its civilian population into the territory it occupies. Now, I would argue that Israel is not an occupying power within the meaning of the Geneva Convention, because actually Judea and Samaria is land that was designated as a Jewish national home by the League of Nations mandate. The only thing that interfered with that is a clearly illegal Jordanian aggression, and I don't think that changes Israel's legal rights. But assuming that Israel could be understood as an occupying power, the question is, who's been deported or transferred? Who's been deported or transferred? When Jews buy a, a house uh, in Hebron or, uh, or the old city uh, of Jerusalem, who's transferring them? And I think that, I think that there's a reason for the use of the non-technical term settler as opposed to transferee. It would sound very strange uh, if you read in the news story, uh, Jewish transferees illegally transferring themselves by building houses for themselves. Who's being, who's being transferred? Now, the... Uh, Indeed, one-third of the settlers, maybe, let's say they were born in the West Bank. Are they transferred or have they been delivered? Is that true, by the way? Yeah, at least. One-third of the settlers who now live on the West Bank were born on the West Bank? I would say that's an estimate, but I think it, it, it's quite fair. It's a very young population. They have a lot of kids. Israeli population in general is very young. Yes, I know. I've never heard that statistic. I don't know enough to know whether it's accurate or not. And I'm not sure it's even relevant. Okay. Okay. So what you're saying here... Well, why not? Because some, let's say someone finds themselves in uh, the so-called West Bank, and they were born there. In what sense have they been transferred? Well, they haven't been transferred or deported. Yeah. And that I've always thought was true. 
that the terms relating to the provision you talked about did not apply, have never applied to what Jews have done on the West Bank. I also do not believe the word occupation is either historically or legally accurate. The question, however, for most people, and that's why I said in the introduction, there are three possible objections to the settlements. One, they're illegal. Two, they're immoral. Three, they're neither, but they're unwise. Mm -hmm. First of all, are they illegal? The first thing to say about the legal argument is already it's a mis it would be uh, mis misunderstanding the nature of the underlying alleged of the relevant legal prohibition to speak about settlements as if they were all one thing. Uh, the underlying provision talks about the occupying power deporting or transferring its civilian population. And we talked about that, and both you and I agree there really is it is near neither transfer but, or deportation. But again, I think even let's say someone didn't agree with us. What I would urge on them is at least there's no such there's no question about settlements in general. The question is how did particular people find themselves in occupied territory? Okay. So maybe let's say the government transfers some people. That doesn't mean that other people didn't go themselves. Okay. The real question yes, though is you want to get to the unwise yeah, part. The real, no. The real question is, is it are Israelis illegally living, illegally under international law, illegally living in the West Bank for some reason? And the argument in the popular notion is that the land somehow doesn't belong to Israel, and therefore Israel should not be settling that land. That's even before we yes. get to the immoral or unwise yes. part. And I'm asking you, as a constitutional lawyer, as someone who knows international law, to the best of your ability, do you believe, are, they, are settlements illegal? Has the United States government ever defined settlements as illegal. The United States government has at times called them illegal and at times has called them legal and has adopted a rather inconsistent position that varies across administrations. Okay, am I wrong to say that the United States does not have an overarching policy calling them illegal? Well, as a matter of fact, our president, when he was still a senator, visited an Israeli settlement. You can visit something that's illegal. He... That doesn't make it legal or illegal. I'm asking you, at the moment, if we went back to the last, the most recent statement by the State Department the or the administration, would they be calling these settlements illegal? I think they would fudge it. Uh, the most recent State Department statements is that they're illegitimate. That now, is correct. That's what, not illegal. Well, it depends where, what you, where you think legitimacy comes from. Uh, now, of course, the Bush administration's view uh, was implicitly that they were legal because in the Bush letter, recognizing that Israel would retain uh, parts of the West Bank uh, based on the existence of settlements there, seems to be premised on the legality or at least legitimacy. I think we can at least say the following. I think you and I would agree. There is no clear-cut American policy that would say, once and for all, Israeli settlements are illegal. Yeah, but it's not American policy, by the way, that determines what international law is. Yes, but it would be interesting to know what our administration says. Yes. Who does determine? When you say it's not the United States government, is there a body which you recognize having the right to say whether they are legal or illegal? There's not a body. Uh, there is a treaty. Right? All, of, all of the discussion is about the meaning of Article 49.6 of the Geneva Convention. Now, there is no authoritative body that can interpret that absent Israel's okay. consent. And at the moment, the question for us is, what do different governments say yes. from their own perspective? And I'm suggesting that from the American perspective, the American government has not taken a clear-cut position that they are illegal. They you have agree? at times. They have at times taken that position. Under whom? Under Jimmy Carter. That's the only one. Uh, and there were some noises in the State Department about it, even in 1968. But on the other hand, under Ronald Reagan and Bush, which is more recent, they've taken quite the opposite position. Right, and they were not illegal under Clinton. Yes. Okay. So certainly, if we look at the immediate past administrations, the American government has not taken the notion that they are illegal. Are they immoral? I'm, I'm not a rabbi. I would, have to, I, would have, I, would have, I would have to defer. But generally, by, I think, what I would understand of conventional notions of morality, I would say it's the notion that a certain ethnicity or population is forbidden from living in its historical, historic homeland or really any place, is what would strike me as more amoral. Okay. By the way, uh, uh, there, this is the grayest area to me. From, to my perspective, they are not immoral. What about unwise? Are they unwise? And by unwise, Eugene, what I mean is 
do they prevent an agreement from being worked out between Israel and the Palestinians that would be to both people's advantage, and that in some way they have been an obstacle that either is being used in a manipulative fashion, or whether there is some honest feeling on the Palestinian side that the settlements prevent the achievement of what they need to ultimately live in peace with the Israeli people? I think the, the, if, the settle, if the settlements are not, first, point, uh, first thing to point out is it takes two to tango. So if the settlements are incompatible with a peace deal, what that means is they're incompatible with Palestinian demands. But that doesn't tell us wh where the problem is in the settlements or the Palestinian demands. I mean, it's quite clearly incompatible with a peace deal in the sense that the Palestinians, as one of their demands, demand that they go because they want two things. They want the territory, they want the territory in question, and they want the, don't, that they don't want there to be Jews there. That's not what you said before. What you said is once the Jews are gone, they will allow Jews to come under well, certain rules no, of immigration. That, that, that's what they say, but there's no reason to believe that claim, especially based on the policies of every other Arab government. Mm -hmm. um, so they want, they want this land and they want, the, uh, they want the Jews cleared off, but it's a problem because it's a territorial dispute. So it's not, the settlements are a symptom of an underlying territorial dispute with the Palestinians. The Palestinians want this land. The question is, do they have a legitimate basis to claim this land? And other than naked desire for it, they don't have a basis in international right, in international law for it. Israel, including the West Bank, has a claim to this territory based on the League of Nations mandate. The Palestinian claim is not ridiculous. Their claim is, we would like it. Right? We want a country which happens to include this territory. So lots of people want lots of things, uh, but it's not, clear, it's not clear what's the claim of right. Okay, I want to tell you what I understand, and I want you to correct yeah. me where I'm wrong. The League of Nations basically divided up the Ottoman Empire after World War I and gave certain peoples certain pieces of land and also asked European nations to be administrations, be administer these territories until the people were ready for self-rule and those were called mandates. And Great Britain gets the mandate on what we call Palestine. At that point, Palestine was on both sides of the Jordan River. Under Britain's right of mandate, it then lopped off all the land to the east of the Jordan River and gave it to the king of Jordan at the time. Pursuant to a particular provision of the mandate. What? what I believe it was Article 25. That is to say, they, they, they had to have a special provision in the actual League of Nations mandate authorizing the suspension of the mandate on the other side of the Jordan River. It's not clear that Britain as mandatory could have just lopped off a half. But Indeed, it, I believe Article five of the mandate pr uh, prohibits putting any part of the mandate under the control of a foreign power. But are you saying that what Great Britain did on the east side of the Jordan River was kosher? Uh, so the only question about its kosher, uh, if I recall correctly, I don't have it in front of me, the provision of Article 25 talked about the suspension, I believe, uh, or uh, the withholding or something of the League of Nations mandate uh, on the east side of the Jordan River. So some people say that doesn't mean completely creating a different country there. So that you can argue you can argue about what it means, but it does seem to be in keeping with what people understood at the time that provision was there for. Well, you're the first person to say that to me. I'm going to go back and look at it. In any case, everything east of the Jordan was taken away from the palace. From pal it no longer was Palestine. Yes, and by the way, when we say Palestine, now it's important to point out it's a purely geographic uh, designation. It As doesn't opposed mean Arab. To? So today we say Palestine means Arab Palestine right. in this sense means no, right. if, if a anything certain piece that, of land. And if anything at that point, the Arabs living there did not went out of their way not to call themselves Palestinian and basically saw themselves either as Arab or Syrians or whatever, but not as Palestinians. But we now have Palestine after World War I, administered by Britain according to the League of Nations. However, after World War II, the League of Nations, which is already now defunct, is basically replaced by the United Nations. Yes. And the United Nations comes up with a resolution that I have understood supersedes the League of Nations decision and that the decision that really occurred in the 30s was that the only way the people living in Palestine could ever work out a way that they would go forward together was if they shared the land in a two-state solution. 
And when that was proposed to the Yeshuv and the Jewish community there, the Jews said yes, and right away the Arabs said no. After World War II, in which the Arabs sided with the losing side, Nazi Germany, once again the League of Nations made a decision. They would split, divide, the, they would share the land among two peoples because both peoples lived there. Palestinians lived there you know, basically in the Ottoman Empire and before the Ottoman Empire. Jews have always lived in Palestine, have always lived in Eretz Yisrael, even after the year 70 when the, when the Romans destroyed the Second Temple and even after the Bar Kokhba revolt was defeated in the second century, Jews remained in Palestine in some number. So Jews claim we've always been here and it's our historic homeland. The Arabs said not only that, we've lived here for centuries. It's our historic homeland. It's our homeland. It's not their center, but it's their homeland. And the, the United Nations said the only way to resolve this dispute is for the two peoples to share the land. And we will create a border, the United Nations did, a ridiculous border, following basically population patterns. And that gave this infant emerging Jewish state, which was not yet called Israel, basically borders along the sea coast and then out into the Negev. And Jerusalem was going to be an international city. A corpus and separatum. what was on the West Bank was to be the Palestinian state. The Jews again said, we'll take it. The Arabs said, under no circumstances will we permit this to happen. The United Nations then voted. It was a very, very small United Nations. 33 nations of the United Nations said, yes, we vote for partition. This was a tremendous victory for the Jewish people at the time, coming out of the Holocaust, where they had not only been, it's not simply that we lost six million, it was the sort of the culmination of centuries of anti-Semitism where no other nation let Jews in and no nation was basically embracing Jews as equal citizens. And the world said, you know what, this people, not this religion, this people have a right to their own homeland in their historic homeland, so we will carve out a piece of Palestine, give it to the Jews, and the rest the Arabs can use for their homeland. The Jews say yes, when I'm done you can correct me. When the Jews say yes, the Arabs say no. Not only the Arabs say no, the day after the state of Israel is declared on May 14th, 1948, the next day the Arab nations invade and they do everything they can to destroy the state of Israel. Israel ends up with more land than the United Nations had originally intended, but the land that was designated for a Palestinian state is now taken, occupied, by Jordan. And Jordan never gives it to the indigenous people there, but says basically, we are the nation of this indigenous people. We will give them Jordanian citizenship, and they will live under our rule. The world community said, we don't accept that. As far as we're concerned, the West Bank remains disputed territory. It is no man's land. It doesn't belong to Palestinians. It doesn't belong to Jews. And it doesn't belong to Jordan. It is at the moment, no, there's no sovereignty in the land at all. That existed from 1948 to 1967. In 1967, when Israel pleaded with Jordan not to enter the war that Nasser and Syria engaged in, lo and behold, Hussein was afraid he was going to lose out. He enters the war. At that point, Israel enters the West Bank in a defensive move. They win, liberate Jerusalem. They liberate the West Bank, and they are now in possession of territory which belongs still to no one. It would have been the Palestinians' land had they accepted the two-state solution that the United Nations voted on in 1947, but since they didn't, it belonged to nobody. There was no sovereignty in this land, and therefore the Palestinians have no right to say it's theirs, but neither do the Jews have a right to say it's theirs. And Israel then went to the Arab world and said, we'll give it all back except for some Jerusalem and some Golan Heights. You can have virtually all of it back on one condition. You make peace with us and you stop the war that began in 1948. The Arabs went to Khartoum, one of the most important points of Middle East history, which most American Jews and most Americans do not know the word Khartoum. The three they went knows. to Khartoum and said the three infamous no's. No negotiation, no recognition, no peace. We refuse to make peace with you and we will not negotiate borders with you. Israel now ends up with 
a presence on the West Bank. It administers the West Bank. It doesn't occupy anything. It's there in territory that does not belong to Palestinians, nor does it belong to Israel. And the Palestinians have a right to live there. The Jews have a right to live there until someone works this out. And from my perspective, there is no question, no question at all, there's nothing illegal about Jews living on territory that belongs to no one. And when people in America say the West Bank belongs to the Palestinians, they are abrogating not only history, but any kind of international jurisdiction. And that in the end, some legal international recognition must be given to this piece of land, but it hasn't happened yet. And what the State of Israel has said now repeatedly, we will give you this land. You can have this land as long as you want to live with us in peace. And the Arabs have said, we don't want to live with you in peace. We don't want you to exist. And Bernard Lewis came on L'Chaim and said what I think is the ultimate statement. If this were a territorial dispute, it would have been decided and over long ago. If it's an existential dispute, if the real issue is that the Arab nations don't want there to be any state of Israel, there will never be a resolution. And that, Eugene, is my summary of where we stand today as an international expert, a professor of international law, I want you to evaluate my summary. I think a very important thing uh, that you touched on, uh, before I get to the area of disagreement, uh, is we have to understand where the West Bank came from. That is to say, people talk about occupied Palestinian territory. And the question is, that is to say, that the, uh, it belongs in a sovereign sense to the Arabs and not to the Jews. And the question is, when did it become Palestinian territory? The League of Nations mandate, uh, the League of, pardon, the United Nations General Assembly Partition Plan, which I'm going to disagree with you in a minute about its legal significance, but the Partition Plan borders did not correspond to the West Bank because the West Bank and the Partition Plan were created in a very different way. The Partition Plan involved some of the West Bank, gave some of the West Bank to the Arabs, some parts to the Jews. The Partition Plan also gave Yaffa, the southern section of Tel Aviv, to, uh, to, uh, to the Arabs. So the West Bank, the so-called Green Line, had no predecessor in any administrative, demographic, topographic. It never existed on any map in any shape or form, it was until 1949, all that the West Bank is, is how far the Jordanian and Iraqi armies together got into invading mandatory Palestine with the goal of meeting up with the Egyptians and preventing the creation of a Jewish state. That is to say, if the uh, Haganah, the Israeli army, had pushed further east, then that, the Jordanians wouldn't be there and no one would be claiming it's occupied Palestinian territory. So why did the Jordanians and Egyptians invade uh, Israel? They wanted to prevent the establishment of a Jewish state. To say that as far as the Jordanian army got, that land is now going to be free of Jews because the Jordanian army it committed illegal aggression there is to retroactively validate the Jordanian and Egyptian aggression against mandatory Palestine. Why, why would one want to do that? And indeed... Excuse me one second. Most of the land that is now in the West Bank was in fact part of what the United Nations said would be the Arab state if it ever accepted the notion of partition. As, as, some, some of it was, uh, and uh, indeed but some of the uh, areas which Israel held on to in 1949 were also part of the land uh, that the General Assembly was going to. Yes, but that doesn't answer the fact that from the Palestinian perspective, the land that is the West Bank yeah had been designated by the United Nations to be part of the Arab state. So let's talk about this designation. So you argue, uh, some people argue, that the General Assembly Partition Plan has legal validity. Correct. And that is entirely not the case. The General Assembly is purely a recommendatory, pure, it's, it's just a, a schmooze fest. Under the Charter of the United Nations, the General Assembly does not have the authority to make, you know, Monday International Secretary's Day. It has no powers to enter into binding decisions. Now, if anyone in the United Nations, if any organ of the United Nations can make binding determinations about borders and such, 
it would be the Security Council acting under its Section 7 authority, and it's not even clear that they could override the League of Nations mandate. The League of Nations mandate was a serious and solemn thing, and it was not inherited by the General Assembly to administer. The, administer, uh, the uh, League of Nations mandate was administered by Britain. When Britain leaves in 1948, that's it. There is no more mandate. When the General Assembly acted in 1947, it didn't act as the custodian of the mandate. It rather acted as just an honest broker trying to propose a compromise that would prevent bloodshed. It was an arbitration, a kind of mediation, saying, guys, here's a proposal. We have a plan that will prevent you guys from fighting. But it was not a legally binding instrument. It, was not a, uh, it, it did not have the effect of further partitioning okay. Palestine because help they don't have the power right, to do that. Help me understand. Are you saying that you know, sometimes there is the written law, and there's, that's the, the Peshat, and there's also the Drash. And very often the Drash takes precedent over the Peshat. What I'm saying, in this instance, what I mean is, I don't disagree that you're technically correct. But did not the world act as if what happened in November of 1947 was a legal international decision? vis-a-vis -vis Palestine? I'm not sure that the world acted that way, because if the world acted that way, so people say it was treated this way, but if the world acted this way, why does everyone, so Israel now, Israel, between 1949 and 1967, even before the Six-Day War, includes, so when people say return to the so-called uh, 67 borders, uh, the 1949 armistice lines, that already includes much territory, which under the UN partition plan, would have gone to an Arab state. That is correct. Yaffa would have gone to an Arab that state. That is correct. Nobody questioned in 1949 at the end of the war the legitimacy of the Israeli presence in Yaffa, suggesting that this was not understood as being an actually binding border demarcation. But let me tell you, the Jews did rejoice, but they rejoiced. It's a very kind of perverse Jewish joy. In 1947, when, uh, when uh, uh, international sentiment since the League of Nations had shifted against the Jews, the Jews were powerless after the Holocaust, they expected to have the whole thing taken from them. They thought they were going to have the whole thing taken from them for political and expedience. And did the United Nations have the right to take the no. whole thing from them? No, but, but, they, but, they, but it, that's why I'm asking you. There's, there is law, there's theory, and then there's real life. If the United Nations had voted against partition, yes. what would have happened? The exact same thing. But people say the United Nations created the state of Israel. Really, when the Arab armies invaded, did the United Nations come to... Uh, lend its support? Did the Security Council authorize the use of force for the defense of Israel? Did they do a single thing to keep the Jewish state from being eliminated? So what would have happened if the partition plan wasn't passed? If Israel declared independence, the exact same thing would happen. The Arab nations would uh, invade. Israel would defend itself, would get borders that do not coincide with the partition plan, and would ultimately be accepted because of its success okay. in arms. The You're making it sound like the partition plan was irrelevant. The international, it was entirely irrelevant. The international community, if the Arabs conquered Israel. I want to get this again. The, you are saying that Listen, hear me out. The international community, if the Arab states succeeded in their plan to wipe out Israel, the international community would not have troubled them for a minute about it. And, if Israel, and, uh, and as it happens, if with or without the mandate, uh, with or without the uh, partition plan, Israel had succeeded in defending itself through force, the international community would have accepted that reality as, in fact, it did. If, if the partition plan was so authoritative and binding, why, why does everyone accept that Yaffa is part of Israel? Nobody thinks, actually, that the General Assembly Partition Plan was a binding document. It was a recommendation. If both sides had accepted it, it would have been binding. It, 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 it helped Israel politically. Politically, it was very important, but not legally. But, mm -hmm. So and this is the you know, Israel often gets sell, sold the same horse twice, <laughs> and constantly in the peace negotiations, Israel is being asked to pay for something which it already bargained for. And in the case of the General Assembly uh, partition plan, Israel was happy to be sold half of the same horse twice. Am I correct? It is inappropriate to say that the land is in some way Palestinian, or that there is any sovereignty in the land at all. In the West Bank. Yes. So there's two, you can take, I think, two views. One view is Israel is the successor to the League of Nations uh, mandate for Palestine. The West Bank is clearly within the borders of mandatory Palestine. Under the League of Nations. Uh, yes. Nothing has happened since to disturb the mandatory borders. So if there is not a general at all, assembly, it belongs to Israel. That's one view. Another view, 
uh, another view, which is slightly different, and uh, I would beg your uh, viewers indulgence because it's a bit, bit of a technical difference, is there is no sovereignty, as you say, because to have sovereignty, you need to have control, and Israel never managed to exercise no, control. No, I'm talking about international law. I'm not talking yes, about... Under, so there's a view of international law that to actually perfect sovereignty, you need to at some point have control of the territory, mm -hmm. because Israel never managed to control the territory because Jordanian and Egyptian... But that's not what I meant when I said it. I said there's no sovereignty because there is no international jurisdiction that now gives it to anybody. It is, uh, under what claim can the Palestinians say they have sovereignty over yeah, the West Bank? The Palestinians clearly don't have a claim. Okay, they don't. That doesn't mean that Israel has a perfect sovereign title either. Yes, and I'm arguing that nobody does, given the way in which history played out. That's a very plausible position. Okay. And Israel might, there is an argument that Israel does have sovereignty. Yes, I understand. But you're saying my borders. argument is also plausible. Yes, and I, but here's a point I really want to stress for your viewers. So your argument's plausible, the argument that Israel is sovereign is plausible. Why don't we know the answer? And here's a crucial point. International law is vastly underdetermined. And even if you don't agree with me on anything else, one thing I would like people to take home is if anyone ever says, in the context especially of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, international law clearly says, show me a precedent. Show me another case not involving Israel in which we learn this rule from or in which this rule has been applied in the past. So the reason we don't know is because there is no clear international rule, and that, that is usually the case. That's not surprising. My mother went to Columbia Law School. She tells a story about a very famous professor she had who ultimately asked the class in a final exam one question. And I don't remember the question, I don't remember exactly how it was framed, but what my mother was saying to me was, it was a question of constitutional law where the students were asked, how would the Supreme Court deal with this question? Mm -hmm. And my mother looked at it for a long time and understood that there was no way that this could be dealt with. And she wrote an answer which basically said that there is a certain sentiment in the nation that is so overwhelming, the Supreme Court can do nothing but affirm that sentiment. Now, it wasn't a civil rights issue where basically popular opinion really is irrelevant, but what she was saying to me was, and I've always remembered it is, there are times when it doesn't matter what the law says, it matters how people experience it. And my sense is that while people, first of all, if people want to agree with what we're saying, they're very happy to hear you talk. You make fascinating points, some of which I've never heard before, and I think you do it brilliantly. And not only that, I don't, uh, except for one issue, area that I said I don't know that I've, I don't, don't know that for the fact the people who have come into Israel, into the West Bank, are people who either their parents or grandparents live there. I just don't know that. Some of them, I didn't okay. say but. I think many of the things you say are in very important for us to hear. But you're saying what but, but, matters is sentiment. Yes. What I'm saying is that I think that there are people who will also be listening to us who will say the following. Very interesting. But the bottom line is we have a problem here between peoples. And that one people is somehow um, experiencing a lesser form of human existence than we want for them and that in some way it is because Israel is dominating them, and that in the end, some form of accommodation must be made, regardless of what the technicality is, international law is, League of Nations, United Nations. I happen to think all this is relevant, but very often people tell me I'm not interested in history. I think they're wrong, but very often the public sentiment is, I only want to know one thing. How do we fix the problem? And yes. the way to fix the problem, they say, is Israel must make an accommodation, and ultimately there must be a Palestinian state on the West Bank, and Israel is preventing that from happening. According to the Palestinians there already, and the United Nations, there already is a Palestinian state on the West Bank way, in Gaza. The, the, they just said they so themselves. Mean, they don't mean it that way. What they mean so, is... Okay, there's what, a, they, what they mean let, is... Let's see what the Palestinians I want. I want to govern myself, the entire West Bank. Ah, I want, I want the Israelis... That's Israeli, not I want to govern myself. I want, I want to govern myself and the settlers, but with the settlers no, gone. No, I don't want the settlers here. Right. And if it's my territory, I have the right to decide who lives here, even if I do it in an immoral fashion. But it's, so, so the question is, what makes it their territory? That that's is, the question. No, that's yeah. not the question. The question is this. Is it to Israel's benefit and the Palestinian benefit 
for there to be some resolution of this conflict, which the world at the moment feels can only be done with a two-state solution. And what they mean by a two-state solution is not simply the United Nations says to Abbas, you're a good little boy, and yes, we agree with you, and you now have a state of your own. What they mean is they want an independent, sovereign state that controls all of their territory, and they will decide whether Jews should live there or not. And I would like the, state, the Palestinian state to say, settlers who are Jewish have every right to stay here as long as they live under a Palestinian flag. And that's, the settlers, that, well, the settlers I mean. then have a right to decide whether they want to live there or not. But that ultimately, the Palestinians have a right to self-rule in all of their land all of their state, well, the question, which is going to be the West Bank. that doesn't Bank. answer the question of what their land is. So in international law... At the moment, they say their land is all the land that was on the other side of the Green Line as of 1967. So, so the Palestinian now, and, definition and that's of, where, of, of that's their land... That's what the President of the United States at one point yeah. acknowledged. But it's a very strange definition of their land. Our land is all the land that two different countries happened to occupy in an illegal war of aggression in 1949. What makes, it, what makes that their land? Because it became a de facto international border ah, after 1949. there I entirely disagree with you. When the, when, the 19, when the armistice line was drawn, when the green line was drawn, there was language attached to the armistice treaty. The green line was just where the Jordanian and Israeli soldiers happened to be. It was a ceasefire line, nothing more. Exactly. And it never became an international border because the very definition, Article 1 of the Jordanian, I believe, Jordanian-Israeli Armistice Agreement says the armistice line shall not be construed as a political boundary. So how, how can that language disappear? That is to say, when you imagine the green line, imagine a little asterisk on it going down to this language, not a border. So if the language not a border disappears, why doesn't the thing to which it's oh, attached I understand disappear? what you're saying, and and there's I, a there's a reason. but it's not the way in which most human beings living in this world view the Green Line. Uh, the, the, okay, well, first of all, I would be very careful about this notion of the world, because it's true. If international law and international politics were a reality show, Israel would have been voted off the island a long time ago. Uh, but it's not clear why, why anyone needs to defer to that. And let me give you an example. The solution sometimes is no solution. European, European, uh, European Parliament, I believe Europe, uh, some organ of the European Union, recently addressed itself to the issue of the ongoing occupation of Europe. Europe is itself under Turkish occupation. Turkey has, is occupying Cyprus, which is a member of the European Union. And what should be the solution, the Europeans were asked. And they said, you know what, we don't want to actually try to force a solution because that can make the Turks mad, and you know they're a little bit more Islamicist now, and that might lead to trouble. We don't want any trouble with them. The best solution is no solution. No solution, the status quo, is a solution, says Europe about Turkish occupation and settlement of Cyprus. I might disagree with them on the merits, but the idea is an interesting one. No solution is a solution. But that is that the Palestinians don't want self-rule, and they don't, even want to, uh, they don't want even a country for themselves. They want a country with themselves, and they want land on which now the va uh, Jews reside. That's a territorial dispute. That's not a dispute about independence, and that is not a dispute about occupation. That is simply a border dispute. And there are many, many ongoing border disputes. People say, well, what should be the solution to Kashmir? So yeah, many people say, well, what's the solution? So why should there be a solution? Is there a solution to the Indo-Pakistani dispute? Is there a solution to the North Korean, South Korean dispute? And these are all disputes of uh, even more ancient vintage. Uh, is there a dis uh, what about, uh, I would worry much more about the Chinese-Japanese dispute over the South Sea or the Russian-Chinese-Japanese uh, dispute, which could result in nuclear war like that, uh, much more than this uh, matter of a few, mile, uh, few miles here or there. What's the answer to Western Morocco? Western Sahara. What's the answer to Cyprus? So the existence of a problem doesn't mean that there's a solution, and the solution itself could be a problem. Is there a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? We have a solution. It is? The status quo. So under the status quo, the Palestinians have a country in every reasonable meaning of the word. Yes, they do not have all the territory that they want for their country. One aspect of the argument is, we will not take 1% of our state unless we can have 100%. It's the exact opposite of what the Jews did in 1947. In, when, when the Jews were offered a little fragment, they said, we will take something. Because here's the thing. The, if you're really under occupation, you would take something over nothing. The best evidence that they actually have 
independence in the sense of they're not being controlled by outsiders. Because if they were being controlled by outsiders, they, uh, they would have taken 90, a 97% deal rather than say, we're going to hold out for 100%. Secondly, if the Israeli-Palestinian issue is settled, if it could ever be actually settled, where would his budget come from? Right now, the vast majority of Palestinian money comes from the European Union, who fund them because of the perceived injustices of the Israelis. If there is ever... Perpetrated by the Israelis. Perpetrated by the Israelis. If there was ever an actual settlement, Palestine would still be a poor Arab country, but this time without European largesse. And uh, Abbas would be the ruler of some poor, half-failed state. I think he understands that. And I think he understands that the right now he has the best of everything. He's the leader of a country. He can travel around, do everything the leader of a country does, meet with world dignitaries, go to the United Nations. You know, he's not Nelson Mandela in a prison somewhere. He's living the life of Riley, and he gets it paid for by the Europeans. And he gets to claim victimhood. So for you now, what's the therefore? You've, you have had a very intelligent, well thought out analysis. You raise very interesting points for all of us to hear. For you, on the ground, what is the therefore in the Middle East today in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Therefore, let me put it like a UN resolution, <laughs> finding that Israel and the West Bank are the most stable and peaceful places in the Middle East, given that the level of violence in the West Bank and Israel is the lowest anywhere in the Middle East. Given that the Arabs in uh, the West Bank, falling under the authority of the Palestinian Authority, have a leader that they elected at least once, unlike much of the rest of, uh, 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 of the Middle East, we should leave it alone. Oh, and, therefore, and given that, we have not found a good solution for the much more important problems of India and Pakistan and Turkey and Cyprus and so forth, we should maybe wait and see what happens. Eugene, it has been a pleasure speaking to you. You are a real, uh, you are a new voice. I am sorry you're in Chicago. I would want you here at this table all the time, both one-on-one, -on -one, and I'd love to hear you debate some people who also... Well, the great thing about New York is, while Jerusalem is the spiritual center of the world, New York is the actual center. And therefore? And therefore, I will, God willing, be coming back many times. I look forward to it. Thank I you. wish you kol tuv You're doing Thank extraordinary you. work. You've been very kind to give us so much of yourself. I appreciate meeting you. Uh, you're a lovely guy, and uh, you're saying things that I hope the audience really heard. Nobody says it as well as you do. Kol tuv Thank you so much. Thank man. you very, very, very much. And have a wonderful... I'll stay in touch with you, Ethan, Absolutely. as you make Aliyah. And hopefully when you have a home in Israel and I'm there, I'll be able to meet you there as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Please come. Thank you. That was our meeting with Eugene Katharovich, a professor of law at North Northwestern University. And Eugene, again, is a fellow with the Lawfare Project. We didn't even get a chance to talk about that next time we will. As always, I'd like to hear what you have to say to the things that Eugene Katharovich suggested here. Please be in touch with me, email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.